Good morning, everybody, or better said, good afternoon for the other half of the world. I am Caroline Mink. I am the executive director of the Swiss Chambers Arbitration Institution. And it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome you to this second webinar jointly organized with the Swiss Arbitration Association. Today, our topic will be on virtual hearings, best practices. We will hear, as you can see, on my left, we will hear first Clarisse von Wunschheim. Clarisse will speak about the various guidelines that are available. She will compare their key features and also their differences. And after that, we will hear David Rooney, who is also on my left side. And he is going to talk about the planification and the virtual advocacy of these virtual hearings. He's going to give tips, do's and don'ts and key issues for success. We will have a next webinar on the 16th of July that will focus on the arbitrator's perspective. If you do not stay until the end of this presentation, we have agreed with Clarice and David that you should at least consider having the following um, take home. Don't overcomplicate things. Don't lose yourself in details. This is arbitration. This is aimed at being time and cost efficient for allowing the business to go on. So this is your duty as counsel, but also as arbitrators to focus and to give priority on these considerations. At the end of the presentations, we will have a Q&A. And for this, we will ask you that you raise your hand if you want to ask a question orally. And during the presentation, if you have a question, a burning question, you can ask it, but please draft it and write it in the chat box and I will moderate. If I may, I would kindly ask you to give you the first advice of the day. Please mute your micros and also your cell phones. And I will now introduce a little bit more Clarice and David before they start their presentations. Clarisse is a partner at Altenburger in Zurich and head of the China Desk. She has almost 20 years experience in international arbitration as secretary, counsel and arbitrator with a special focus on Sino-European disputes. In recent years, she has also developed a practice in the field of commercial mediation as a mediator. She's also a member of the Sky Court and of the ASA Marketing Committee. And she's currently herself preparing as counsel for a major hearing, which will be held partially virtually. Maybe you will ask about this later on. As far as David Rooney is concerned, David is the co-leader of Sidley Austin, global arbitration trade and advocacy practice. He's based in Geneva, in Switzerland. David has more than 25 years of experience acting as counsel before International Arbitral Tribunal in commercial, but also in investment disputes involving many different sectors and activities, ranging from major energy projects to sports broadcasting. These disputes have involved a host of different applicable laws and places of arbitrations, ranging from London to Stockholm to Hong Kong, and he forgot to mention it, but of course, Switzerland. <laughs> In addition, David has, has served as presiding arbitrator, sole arbitrator, and co-arbitrator in numerous international arbitrations. David, of particular interest for today, David is co-founder and president of the Board of Trustees of the FIAA, the Foundation for International Arbitration Advocacy. In that capacity, he has provided training in the examination and cross-examination of fact and expert witnesses to hundreds of international arbitration practitioners around the world. He is also a member of the Swiss Chambers Arbitration Institution Court of Arbitration. And with this, Clarice, I give you the mic, not the floor, but the mic. Well, the virtual floor. So we did rehearse in advance to a test run, so everything should run, run smoothly. Let's cross the fingers. So yes, welcome everybody. I'm glad to see that despite the mushrooming of webinars online and especially on the topic that we are dealing with today, we still have a very high attendance rate. So thank you very much everybody for taking the time joining us 
And we hope with David that we can make that a bit interactive at the end of our sessions. So David and I discussed how can we bring added value to the discussion about virtual hearings. It's some, so much is being published, so much is being said, and we really want to give you some concrete takeaways today. So in my first part, I will cover the guidelines just to give you an overview of what's out there, what are the main guidelines, and how do they differ from each other? How do they complement? Where do you have to look at for what kind of issues? In the second part, I will give you just a few issues that we consider constitute the key issues that you have to focus on to make virtual hearing successful. And David will then take the floor again to give you advice on the advocacy. So if we look at the guidelines, we can actually distinguish pre-COVID and post-COVID era. Um, virtual hearings are not a new thing. Um, they've been used in the past, though Lawyers are a bit slower than other industries, arbitration practitioners apparently also. So it took a while until people really get got familiar and comfortable with virtual hearings. But um, one of the major publications on the topic is the ICC Commission Report on Information Technology. And if you look at it, this report actually is not just about virtual hearing. It's pre-COVID, as I mentioned, and it's actually a broad technological guide on how to switch from a paper-based, presence-based arbitration process to an electronic virtual arbitration process. So this guide is actually quite comprehensive. And one of the added value of this guide is that you will find sample clauses to put into your terms of reference or procedural orders. Um, in order to ensure the use of appropriate IT. The next one is the guide to good practice on the use of video link under the Hague Evidence Convention. Yes, you're right. The Hague Evidence Convention does not apply to arbitration because it applies to actually court proceedings. But the content in there about how to conduct video conferencing, especially as concerns um, witness testimony is quite interesting and shows you already that people were thinking about that in a broader context than just COVID or just arbitration. Even courts are considering taking witness testimony by video conference. So it's also pre voted It's quite comprehensive. It's 170 page long, but uh, just a few of these pages would be relevant to you as an arbitration practitioner. Um, yes, because it's mainly done for court proceedings. The next one is the SOL protocol on video conferencing and international arbitration. The, um, they were the first one really reacting out of the COVID situation with an extensive protocol on how to proceed. So it is a reaction to the COVID-19 crisis, but it is not just limited to the COVID-19 situation. It's a general guide on how to use video conferencing in international arbitration. It's seven page long and it deals really with the main issues that you have to consider. Um, I consider the strong point of the SOL protocol is the detailed list of technical specifications that you may want to pay attention to before setting up a, a video conferencing in an international arbitration proceeding. The next one is, um, yes, there are a lot of guidelines you can see. The next one is um, from the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, CR guidance note on remote dispute resolution. This is also mainly a reaction to the COVID-19 situation. It's nine page long. It's very similar in content to the SOL protocol in, in terms of coverage of issued covers. But the additional value of the CRP guidance note is that it addresses more extensively the issues of confidentiality and privacy concerns. And it also provides a useful checklist um, to, that you can apply before actually proceeding with online proceedings, virtual hearings. The next one is quite an interesting one, the Delos checklist. This checklist is actually done specifically for COVID-19. So COVID-19 has not just been an, you know, um, kind of the driving force of it, but it's actually at the center of it. And it's not just for virtual hearing. It's a very useful checklist to actually allow you to determine whether in a situation of a pandemic like COVID-19, what happens with your hearing? Is it necessary to kind of, you know, say, oh, we don't, we postpone the hearing entirely, we do it partially virtually, uh, we do it entirely virtually. So this checklist is really 
from a broader perspective, how do you need to adapt your hearing? And it's not just for virtual hearings, it also addresses hybrid cases of maybe the best solution for your case is to have partial uh, virtual hearing partially on site where certain people can, can meet. And another added value of this checklist is that it also addresses some of the um, protocols, etiquettes about maintaining distances, health protections, things like that. Obviously, that will depend as the situation evolves, as the governmental restrictions also evolve. But um, it's an innovative aspect of this checklist compared to all the others. The next one is the ICSID that will not concern so many of you. ICSID investment arbitration. The procedures are huge. The amounts in disputes are huge. So it's not surprising that the ICSID actually set up its own video conferencing platform with really IT support and quite a sophisticated way to deal with it. They have professionals on site to assist the tribunal at any time. Um, so, but this is mainly for investment arbitration. And last but not least, it's hidden here by the by our, let me change the site. Uh, the HKIC guidelines for virtual hearings. I like them because they are pragmatic. They are also a reaction to the COVID-19, but of course they apply to a broader situation than just uh, COVID-19. They touch on all essential issues and HKIC is actually providing quite some support for such a small um, institution to help you make the virtual hearing a success. And it, cons it, cons um, it contains also useful rules on, on behavior, you know, what to do with your mic and your camera and all that things. So that's quite a lot of guidelines and you have to read them all in detail. No, of course not. Uh, we don't have the time for that and we couldn't charge the client for it even if we had the time for it. So what do you do? And here's my three bullet point takeaway. Um, start with the CR guidance note or the HKIC, actually. You can choose one of the two, just to have a, a clear picture of what are the key issues that we need to tackle. Then, if you're looking for sample terms to include in your procedural documents, uh, the ICC report is very useful because it really provides you with template language to incorporate and make sure that you have a procedural legal basis for the use of IT in your proceeding. And if you want to look more into technological requirements, how to ensure privacy, how to make sure you have a sufficient good connection, these kind of really technical issues, then the SOAP protocol is probably the, the handiest guideline to revert to. Now this brings me already to my second part, which are which are the key issues really that will make the success or the failure of your virtual hearing. The first one I mentioned are the technical requirements. Your internet connection, is it ethernet, is it Wi-Fi? You know, what's the strength? Uh, should it be IP based? Should it be web based? All these technical requirements, you have to look at what kind of camera, is it what, what kind of browser is it compatible? Um, also the microphones, all these technical issues, which are quite important because if you can't see or hear each other, uh, it's not just a practical issue, it's also an issue that will affect the right to be heard. So here it's a very tricky issue because the technicalities can really have an influence on very substantial procedural rights. The most important aspect of the technical requirements is the choice of a video conferencing platform. And here mainly you have the choice between what we call IP-based, which means that you have your own line. It's like a telephone line, but it's just a video line. So you would give the other party your telephone number, but it's an IP address and this other person would connect via IP. So that's sort of a private video conferencing line. It's quite expensive and it requires quite some IT knowledge and facilities. And we are now in the era of uh, Internet uh, 20.0, actually. So there are a lot of web-based conference uh, softwares that are very good. You've heard them, they've been out there. There is WebEx, there's Teams, there is Zoom with all the confidentiality, privacy controversy around it. There is BlueJeans, there is Webinar Jam. So there are quite a lot out there. And it's up to you as parties to determine which is the best one. 
What I consider very important aspects of it is how many participants can be shown on the screen at one time. How is document sharing? How easy is the sharing of documents and the passing of control? And third, last but not least, breakout rooms. If you are in a full virtual hearings and your software does not entitle you to use breakout rooms, it's going to be very cumbersome because every time there is a break, you will need to have a separate connection or separate conference on the other side, and that will make things very complex and, and very delicate, actually. So I think these are really the three uh, key issues to look at when you choose your web-based conference platform. Appropriate behavior rules during video conferencing, how to dress, how to speak, these will be touched upon by David, so I'll just skip over it. The same applies to the method of document sharing. David will tell you later on a um, specific recommendation of what to pay attention to about document sharing. The one point I want to say a few words on is the integrity of witness and expert examination process. So. Imagine you, I'm here in the room and I'm examining a witness somewhere else in a room. And of course, the parties want to make sure this witness has everything it needs on one side. But on the other side, also, it is not in communication with anybody else, either telling him answers or advising him um, or otherwise being influenced by third parties. So the question is, how do you ensure that your witness, which is examined by video conference, is really alone in the room and does not have access to other information that the one you share on the screen? There is the 360 degrees um, video camera that you can supervise that no one else is in the room. But you would have to run that several times um, during the examination or have it all the time run. So that's a bit cumbersome. And the problem with that is it doesn't ensure that the witness is not communicating in any other way, um, for example, through the computer. So theoretically, you would also need to provide the witness with a third party computer, which is not his, with no files on it, no social media. Um, on the computer that next to the screen could be giving or, or sending information. So this topic, you can see you, it can get really complicated and cumbersome, and that will depend on the level of trust between the parties. If the parties and the lawyers can trust each other on professional standards, then that will help really a lot. If parties are in a big um, distrust towards another, uh, I'm currently in a case where one party wants to supervise the witness and the other party wants to supervise the lawyer supervising the witness. Um, so it can get really complicated. So this is an issue to uh, definitely tackle from the beginning. And maybe video conferencing for witnesses that can travel is not the best. Just something to take away and think about. And the last point, fallback communication plan. Let's say we have a largely virtual hearing and you are not sitting next to your client or you are not sitting together with your team. How do you ensure internal communication if you have no breakout rooms? And even if you have breakout rooms, the breakout rooms is outside the hearing. So the hearing is stopped and then everybody enters the breakout rooms. But if you need to communicate with each other during the hearing, you cannot use the breakout room. So you would have to have a separate communication system in place if you are not sitting together with your client and uh, your team members. It, you can use your phone or we use, for example, Teams and you can download also team software on your phone and you have your phone next to the screen with instructions coming from the client or comments coming from your team members. For example, the sticky notes that the second chair would put on the desk of the third chair with the comments about the files of the documents. Obviously, that's not possible if you're not sitting next to each other. But here I'm already getting into the area of David's part. And so I'm happy to pass on the word to David at this stage. Great. Thanks so much, Clarice. So it's a real pleasure to be with you all here today on this As a Sky webinar of virtual hearings. Um, as we all know, that the tragedy of the COVID-19 pandemic has presented some new challenges to the international arbitration community with all the travel restrictions and the physical, physical distancing measures in place, arbitrators, council, and institutions across the world have really had to fundamentally rethink 
our approach to evidentiary hearings. Now, the good news is that the international arbitration community has really risen to this challenge. And most people have really embraced all these amazing new technologies that we have that enable us to conduct virtual hearings with people really all over the world. Um, but you know, what does that mean for us as advocates? And today I'm gonna to focus a little bit on, on advocacy. And as you know, advocacy is the art of persuasion. And this is a deeply human exercise. And it means the challenge for counsel in virtual hearings is really twofold. How do you make the most uh, and best use of the technology, technology that's available today so that uh, you are able to present your client's case in the most effective and powerful way possible? But also, how do you maintain that human connection that's really so important for all of us to be effective as counsel in international arbitration? So I'm gonna to try to touch on those two main challenges and look at some of the real detailed, practical oriented uh, guidance. So let's focus first on some of the basics. Really, I think the most important uh, thing for counsel to keep in mind at all times is that you have to approach a virtual hearing like a traditional hearing. So what does that mean? It means that you have to be focused on professionalism and respect in everything that you do. Dress professionally. It may seem like an obvious point, but we're hearing stories, for example, from some US judges complaining about counsel turning up to virtual hearings dressed for the beach or participating from under a duvet in bed. Obviously, that's not the best thing for showing respect and professionalism to your tribunal. You obviously need to remain present in the hearing throughout. And basically, you just have to be aware of the fact that you're on camera and that you have to act appropriately at all times. The other thing that's important at the very outset is to put in place a professional setting. You want to ensure that you're well lit from the front, because if you have lighting from the back, for example, a window in the back, um, the participants will not be able to see your face properly. You have to ensure that your background is appropriate. Some of these platforms offer various fun virtual backgrounds that you can put in place. So you may be tempted to add drama by making it appear that you're in a Gothic cathedral or perhaps on the bridge of the Starship, Starship Enterprise. Now, that may add some drama, but frankly, it's quite distracting and is going to detract from the effectiveness of your advocacy. Some points that we learned from a famous BBC interview a few months ago, close the door so that you're not disturbed during the course of the hearing. Try to ensure that your camera is set appropriately so that your head and shoulders are centered on the screen. One of the most key pieces of guidance that we all have problems with is switch off or mute other devices that might make a sound during the course of the hearing. One other really practical point, and this is something that should be agreed with everyone involved in the hearing, is that you should enter your name, your law firm, and then C for claimant or R for respondent, so that when your picture appears on the screen, everyone immediately knows who you are. One of the challenges for the participants, and in particular the tribunal, is simply keeping track of who's who. It's not like when you're in a, a physical hearing room and you immediately see which side of the table counsel are on. So that's a very practical point that can really make life easier for everyone participating in the hearing. The next thing is to think about a speaking protocol and agree to that either prior to the virtual hearing or at the outset. And this is important to ensure that all of the advocacy unfolds in an organized way um, and with proper respect and courtesy to everyone involved. Um, so this means if you're going to be speaking at the outset, it's obviously important to identify yourself so that everyone knows who's speaking. It's important to ensure that everyone can see and hear you because we all forget to turn that, uh, that mute button back on when we're ready to speak. So mute your microphone unless you're speaking and remember to unmute when you are speaking. It's very important not to speak over others, and this is really one of the great challenges of these virtual platforms. Some of them are quite good in terms of enabling some over speaking, but the bottom line is it's going to make it very difficult for the tribunal to hear you and hear the witnesses, and that's also going to make it very difficult for the court reporter who's taking a transcript. So it's really important to leave probably more pauses between each time you speak and the next, next speaker interjects than you might otherwise do in an actual hearing. 
Now, if you do want to interject or interrupt another speaker, there's a couple of ways you can do that. You can just raise your hand physically, or some of these platforms also enable you to virtually raise your hand to draw attention to the tribunal that you would like to interject. A last point with respect to speaking protocol is think about green to limit the number of people with cameras on at any given time. The difficulty is that if you have 20 plus participants involved in any virtual hearing, that can become quite distracting for the tribunal um, and in particular for the witness. So one of the, one of the good uh, approaches is simply to agree that only the tribunal, the witness, uh, and perhaps the lead counsel and check, second chair for each counsel team will have their cameras on during the course of the hearing. That can keep everyone focused on the key speakers. Let's spend a moment then discussing oral submissions. Now, we're all quite familiar with the basic rules of effective oral advocacy, but those rules are worth reiterating because in the context of virtual hearings, they become more important than ever. It's very important to ensure that your oral submissions are concise and focused and very well structured. There's no doubt that there's a greater challenge for the tribunal to stay engaged during the course of a hearing and your role as counsel is really to try to make that as easy as possible for them. So what does that mean concretely? Well, if you're going to be making an opening statement, start with an impact line. Make sure that you get the attention of the tribunal immediately. That means, you know, focus on what is this case about and why does your client win? Then turn to setting out a clear structure at the beginning of your submissions. Often it's very helpful to give number of points. This opening statement will address five main points. That immediately gives the tribunal a structure which they can then follow during the course of your submissions. Then as you work through your submissions, it's very important to provide frequent guideposts. So referring the tribunal back to your structure and telling them exactly where you are in it as you progress through it. Now, you have the opportunity to put up documents and legal authorities, but the key at a virtual hearing is really, again, to be focused. Only take the tribunal to those key documents and authorities that are most important for your presentation. There are a lot of different things going on in the court virtual hearing. The tribunal is getting a lot of different information through different channels, and you want to make sure that they're listening to your submissions carefully and not distracted by having too much going on at the same time. The last point here is, Make good use of your written submissions. As I said, you know, the reality is that it is more challenging to get the attention of the tribunal, and to the extent you can refer them back to specific provisions of your written submissions that they can look at after the oral submissions, that's going to be extremely helpful for them. So make sure you make full use of that opportunity. Now, virtual oral advocacy certainly requires additional care on a few points. It's very important to try to maintain eye contact with the camera. It's very easy to think about um, you know, looking down at your notes as you might ordinarily do if you're in a physical room, but that becomes really very distracting if you're on camera because it means you're never actually looking at the tribunal. So one of the, the tricks that works extremely well is to put your notes up on the screen in front of the camera. So basically you're able to look at your notes and look directly into the camera. It's very important to avoid reading verbatim. There's something that happens when you read notes verbatim through these virtual platforms that really comes across as very dead, uh, and you definitely lose something in terms of your ability to connect with the tribunal. So it's much more important to have bullet points uh, so that you won't be tempted to, to read verbatim. It's also important to speak more slowly than you might otherwise do, and to be conscious of that, because again, things get lost through the virtual media. You wanna speak deliberately and with emphasis so that you're engaging the tribunal and that they don't tune out as you go through the different points of your oral submissions. As you probably see on this presentation, expressions, facial expressions, hand gestures are extremely visible in these kind of formats. So you have to be con very conscious of that. You're on camera and people can see exactly what you're doing. So you have to be particularly disciplined in maintaining your poker face, not reacting to things that are being said, uh, because it's, it's all extremely visible to the tribunal. More so than in, in a physical hearing, when you can pick up physical cues from the tribunal, it's important to allow pauses as you work through your oral submissions. And that will give the tribunal to interject if they have questions 
or if they require clarification. So try to do that in a very deliberate way. And again, in the same vein, it's important to periodically stop and ask the tribunal if they have questions. Because once again, it's going to be hard for them to interject in the same way that they could in, in, in the context of a physical hearing. So you really want to give them every opportunity to engage with you so that your oral submissions are a dialogue and, and not simply a, a set presentation. Let's move on then to witness questioning. Again, you know, this is one of the areas where there are a lot of different challenges. And the challenges come from a variety of different sources. The first and most basic one is that you may have difficulties ensuring that the witness can hear and see you. So before you're beginning any set of questioning for your witnesses, you wanna stop and just confirm they can hear you and they can see you, everything's clear and there's no difficulty with the technical communications. The second point is you want to ensure that the witness only has a clean copy of the materials in front of them. Clarice touched on this point. It's one of the biggest challenges in conducting cross-examination virtually because you know, unless you have somebody from your counsel team in the room where the witness is sitting, it's, it's quite difficult to really verify that they don't have other materials, that they don't have any notes, that they're not getting text messages from opposing counsel. But at a minimum, you want to cover those points at the beginning of your cross-examination and make sure that the witness understands that they're not supposed to be doing that uh, and that it would be improper to do so. Then one of the keys, whether it's examination in chief or cross-examination, is really to focus on the fundamentals of good questioning technique. You know, you're dealing with a more complicated um, format and platform with a virtual hearing. And also if you're dealing with a more co a complex subject matter, it's really important to go back to the basics and think about how to make your questioning as clean and simple as possible. It's important to speak slowly and to avoid talking over the witness. Again, that's gonna pre prevent the tribunal from hearing the witness. And it's also going to be a problem for the court reporter in the preparation of the transcript. It's important to use headlines as you progress through your, your questioning. So it means every time you come to a new topic or subject matter, you want to headline that topic. For example, let's now turn to the negotiation of the contract. That gets everyone on the same page. The witness of the tribunal knows that you're moving to a new topic and everyone understands where your questioning is then going to progress. Ask short questions with only one fact per question. Again, this is very, very important to ensure that there are no miscommunications and the witness is focused on exactly what you're asking. Now for examination in chief, where you're questioning your own witness, it's best to use open questions. So the who, what, why, when, where, describe questions. You want the focus to be on your own witness, not on you as the lawyer. And you wanna give the opportunity to your own witness to tell their story to the tribunal. By contrast, in cross-examination, it's, it's important in the virtual context in particular to use primarily closed questions. So these aren't inquiries, they're statements of fact that you're putting to the witness. So it's not who negotiated the contract for the manufacturer, it's Ms. Jacob negotiated the contract for the manufacturer, didn't she? And you wanna use those closed questions because it's particularly difficult to keep the witness focused and on track during the course of the cross-examination. And really your objective there is to use the opposing party's witness to tell your case theory through that witness. And using closed questions is the best way to achieve that objective. Obviously it's important there not to interrupt the witness. Um, again, that causes all kinds of communication difficulties that are only amplified in the context of a virtual hearing. A couple of other points with respect to witness questioning. You just have to realize that your questioning is going to take longer than usual. So that means that you've got to be more focused. You really need to drill down and look at what are the critical points that you want to make during your cross-examination and examination in chief. You also have to be realistic about what you can achieve through cross-examination. You're not going to be able to ask a rapid series of questions in order to pin the witness down or destabilize them. It's very hard to exert pressure on a witness through the virtual format or to use body language in the way that you might do in a hearing room. 
So really, you just need to focus on those fundamental techniques of good, short, clean, closed questions. That's going to be what enables you to get your case theory across through your cross-examination. And just generally speaking, because of all these additional challenges, you just have to be less ambitious about what you're going to try to cover, or what you're going to try to achieve with your cross-examination. Now, the role of documents in virtual advocacy uh, is, is critical. Uh, it's very important to plan and rehearse with your documents in advance so you're not struggling with that during the course of the hearing. You're going to want to give careful, careful consideration as to whether you want the full record of documents available or only a smaller compendium of the key documents that might be easier for the tribunal and the witness to navigate. That obviously, you know, you lose some flexibility if you only have a compendium and it means you have to decide in advance what are those documents going to be. So that's one of the challenges. Think about having one of your team members manage all the documents and use screen sharing. It's hard to focus on your questioning, focus on the witness, and also take care of managing all the documents at the same time. So that's where having a team member take on that responsibility can be very, very helpful. The advantage of screen sharing is that it enables uh, you, your team member to focus on the, the key documents, get it up on the screen, and then you can annotate them, you can highlight them to bring out the most important passages. So that can be a really useful way to have the witness focus on the most important package, passage and the tribunal as well. In advance of the hearing, you may wanna think about discussing with the tribunal whether and how they would like to annotate the documents. If they would like to mark them up, it might be possible to get them um, uh, software for their tablets that allows them to take notes on the documents that are being used as they're uh, being examined during the course of the hearing. As I mentioned, it's, it's best probably to put the documents up on the screen through screen sharing. Different platforms uh, provide different mechanisms for doing that, but it, it usually is the best way to ensure that the witness is focused on the, the relevant document when you want them to be focused on it. As you turn to a document, as you would in a regular hearing, it's very important to identify the document clearly. So the exhibit number, the title of the document, the date, all of those things you want to be clearly set out before you turn to asking questions about it or making submissions. And then similarly, you want to turn the witness to each relevant passage clearly before you begin to address it. Particularly in cross-examination, it's very important that you as counsel read in all the quotes so that you give the you get to the right quotes for, for starters and the witness isn't confused, and also that you're able to read in the quote with the emphasis on the passages that you would like to emphasize. One other uh, major complication in virtual hearings is the role of interpreters, and it really requires some careful planning. If it's necessary, give careful thought as to whether it's going to be sequential or simultaneous. Simultaneous translation in the virtual context requires a lot of planning and additional equipment because there has to be a way to uh, mute out uh, all the exchanges that are happening in the language that's being interpreted from and ensure that people are only hearing the interpretation into the language of the arbitration. So that is going to involve um, additional technology that can be complicated. So in a, in a smaller case where that cost can't be borne, sequential interpretation may be the way to go. And then, you know, some of the other guidelines in terms of interpreters are the same ones that apply at a regular hearing. It's important to give the core materials to the interpreters in advance. You want to agree on a lexicon of key terms in advance so that there's no confusion about specific terminology and translations of them. And I think just generally you have to recognize that all of the advocacy is going to take much longer with interpreters. There's, there are going to be miscommunications, there's going to be confusion, and you just need to build all that into your planning. And once again, probably keep, just be a little bit less ambitious than you might otherwise be with your advocacy. The last point I wanted to touch on is the importance of teamwork. It's really essential for effective virtual advocacy. Ideally, if it can be arranged, it's best to have your counsel team and your client team all at the same location. That enables you to have those communications where you're passing each other notes during the course of the advocacy and you know exactly in the same way that you would in, in a regular hearing room. So there, there are a lot of advantages to doing that if it's possible. Obviously, it may not always be possible, whether because of the restrictions from COVID-19 
or any other travel restrictions that might be in place. If council and clients can't be at the same location, um, Cleary's mentioned two of the critical points, virtual breakout rooms become very important. And you also wanna put in place a separate IT platform for communications between the council team and the client team so that you can virtually pass those notes. It's very important to ensure that those notes don't become visible to the tribunal or the witness. Um, so you need to think about that carefully. And there have been horror stories about how people have not managed that so well in the tribunal and the opposing party becomes aware of those communications. You really wanna avoid that happening and ensure that you have the right platform in place to ensure that it doesn't. Because of the importance of teamwork, think about asking the tribunal for more frequent collaboration breaks so that you have an opportunity to consult with your team members and your client and get input in terms of how things are going, um, how the tribunal is responding to different points, how the tribunal is responding to questioning and the, and, and the witness uh, interaction. All of that, again, is much, a much greater challenge in the virtual context, and you want to have the opportunity to take a step back and recalibrate your approach if it's, if it's not going the way in which you want. Key point, if counsel, the council team and the client team is together in the same location, the team interactions may be very visible on camera. So once again, you need to be conscious of that fact. Everyone who's going to be on camera needs to be aware of that fact and be very careful in maintaining their poker face and maintaining a professional demeanor throughout. So I'm going to stop there and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the main conclusions and takeaways with respect to virtual hearings. And we're going to do a little bit of a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So let's kick off with some of the strengths and Clarice is going to take the lead here. Switching my mic on again first before speaking. Thank you, David. Um, yes, we wanted to kind of sum up all the issues and give you some takeaways. And we thought the structure of a SWOT, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threat would be a good approach because not everything is golden. There is a lot of opportunity here, but there are also a lot of pitfalls and threats. On the strength side, clearly there are new options that are getting open for new ways of advocacy, for new ways of holding a hearing or, or making a case. And quite importantly, I think also that it will reduce the need to travel. And reducing the need to travel will mean that your agenda will become much more free because you don't have to spend one day getting to the hearing location. So don't underestimate that. These are really the key two strands that we see in this new way of holding hearings. With respect to weaknesses, obviously there are technical risks inherent in any sort of virtual hearing. Um, no matter how much planning that goes into it, things can go wrong and you have to plan for that. Uh, and sometimes that can pose a major problem. The second major challenge is what I alluded to earlier. It's the lack of a feeling of an audience and that human connection. So you have to be very conscious of that and work to overcome that. And from my perspective, that's really one of the, the big challenges and drawbacks of virtual hearings. Um, I think I'll quickly discuss opportunities. Um, Clarice has referenced you know, the, the cost and time saving. Obviously, you cut down on both travel time and cost uh, for everyone involved in the hearing. Uh, the cost of hearing rooms and hotels uh, will almost always outstrip the cost of any sort of virtual hearing platform that you're going to use. Um, in, in terms of the opportunities, think of it also as an opportunity to grow as a professional. You need to rethink and grow your advocacy skills using technology. And I think a lot of us have found over the course of the COVID-19 period that these technologies work remarkably well. I myself have been involved in a couple of advocacy workshops with FIA over the last couple of weeks where we've done training for 24 up to 40 participants um, situated around the world, and it's worked extremely well. And I've done hearings where it's worked extremely well also. So the technology is there. I think with the right planning, there is a, you know, a huge opportunity to work in a more efficient and effective way as council. And with opportunities comes threat. And there clearly the major threat that Caroline already mentioned in her introduction is the risk of overcomplication. Um, as you can see, there are various issues, technological specificities, uh, witness integrity, document sharing. So if you want to make it complicated, you can. And I think here really our duty is to use that as a chance to make it easier for the clients and more business friendly even than it is today and not go the other way and make a huge thing out of every little issue that will arise in the context of virtual hearing. 
The other threat that we see also is that people are so focused on the technology and, and using features and making geeks and stuff and this, or people not familiar with it that are constantly stressed that the line will break or that it won't uh, work the way it should, that the content gets lost over um, over the technology actually. So people are more focused on making it work than actually listening to what's being said. And this is why it's so important to have arbitrators as well as counsel that are not just familiar, but really comfortable using the technology. And this is again, really an opportunity for the younger generation, not that the older generation can't learn it. You have the, 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 the proof here online, but clearly that's an opportunity for the young generation to take more room but here again, careful not to make technology a, a game, but rather the, to use really technology to focus more on the content of your advocacy. Well, many thanks, Clarice and David. Uh, this was extremely interesting. I learned a few things and I noticed that I committed a few mistakes in the beginning of my presentation, so I apologize for it. I changed my screen, for example, if you, and that's maybe one thing that you have not mentioned, uh, if you have two screens, uh, I think it's most useful uh, for these types of presentations or for virtual hearings or maybe even three screens, but it allows you to, to play between where is the camera, where is your document, uh, where is the, 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 the room. And I, I think if you have the, the luck of having these technologies available and, and, and can afford to have those, I think it's very useful. Uh, another point is, uh, I have been focusing on technology instead of content, so it will be my pleasure to watch this presentation again. We will post the videos on the on our website on YouTube. Um, so for those of you who may have joined later or who have to leave earlier, feel free to 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 have a look at these presentations later on. We will advertise when these are live. And in the meantime, we have a few questions that uh, have been asked, and uh, the first one would be from Mr. David Van Gelder. Do you have experience with remote viewing of the witnesses computer along with the 360 camera? This was a question actually on your part of the presentation, Floris. Yes, and actually I do not have the experience yet. I haven't used the 360 tool. David, have okay. you? David? No, but what I've seen in take places that people ask the witness to basically pick up their web camera or their computer and just turn it around the room. So it's a much more low tech solution, but it achieves the same objective. But maybe someone in the audience has used that. Could the, if that's the case, could that person raise the hand? Not on camera, obviously, but with the button speak. I had a request to speak from Mr. Olivier Marquin. I have allowed him to speak. Maybe he wants to speak. I think he's gone. Uh, maybe he's gone. So let's go back okay. to the chat. Okay, raise the hand. It shows you that they're very. I mean, we have 107 people currently online, and nobody uh, seems to have the experience with that. Um, I've seen Clarice that you have already answered one of the question online. We have a, a question by Thomas Legler. He asked whether you think that such hearing will be used more and more in the future, or is this just a COVID-19 um, temporary feature? Do you think uh, without sanitary reason it will be used? You have answered at the end of the presentation, but uh, do you want to comment? I, well, maybe I'll kick off. I, I do think it will become more common. I think we've all grown much more accustomed to this technology and much more comfortable with it and i think we've seen that it, it does generally work pretty well um although you know i think as as all of us have commented today you do still lose something and you lose that human interaction and i'm not sure you know the the witness hearing in an international arbitration is part of that process of kind of catharsis and you know having your your day in court so to speak and i think it's not quite the same through a virtual hearing um, so I think there is still a, a real attraction for those human reasons to having in-person hearings, but clearly, you know, in smaller cases or cases where um, it's just too complicated for whatever reasons to gather everyone in a room, people are much more comfortable now with this option. I largely share David's view. I also think um, probably fully online hearing will not mushroom. 
but partial aspects, certain aspects of a hearing, I think, will be dealt with more and more online, especially witness examination or experts that can't really travel well. And there we might have a bit of a Röschtigraben between the common law and the civil law lawyers, because we civil law lawyers, we put more weight on the documents. Um, and we are not so adamant about the witness testimony. And on the other side, common law lawyers tend to put much more weight on the witness examination with barristers coming and making their show. So in that context, I can also imagine that there will be maybe a broader use of video conferencing for witness examination in civil law um, cultured cases rather than in a common law context. But future will tell. Okay. We have a question from Jun Zen. Um, he's asking, uh, well, this person is asking whether there could be a situation where having virtual hearings might lead to awards being subject to setting aside procedure, uh, proceedings. Honestly, it could. Um, it depends a bit on the procedural framework that underlines the arbitration. The ICC guidelines make it clear that the relevant articles in the ICC rules are to be interpreted in a way that the tribunal can, has the power to decide on IT and how to do it. So in an ICC-related arbitration, for example, I, the, the, the room for that kind of uh, loopholes is, is quite limited. But depending on the legal framework of your, of your arbitration, you need to double, you need to make sure that um, if the parties don't agree, the tribunal has the necessary powers to impose certain methods on the parties. Yes. I think that's right. And some of the rules are, are quite express about this. And I think the Swiss rules are amongst those rules where there's an express reference to the power of the tribunal to conduct hearings through video conference. So if that is in, in the applicable rules, then the use of this technology obviously wouldn't provide a ground for setting it aside. But I, I also think that generally speaking, a party would have to do more than just point to the fact that there was a virtual hearing. I think they would need to show that somehow it compromised their ability to fully and fairly present their case in order to set aside an award. I think we have covered uh, a few persons have commented on the side of the screen, the size of the screen. I think I, I personally made the experience uh, today by changing screen and adapting. So yes, a bigger screen does change what you view and you may see additional features on a bigger screen. So it's important to, to, to have a, a screen that is large enough. Um, I have a question from Simon Nesbitt. As arbitrator, I have experienced parties resisting the suggestion of a virtual hearing and preferring to postpone, sometimes by several months, in the hope that by then it will be possible to hold an in-person uh, in hearing. As counsel, how would you view uh, a tribunal refusing to postpone and insisting on a virtual hearing, subject, of course, to what the applicable rules and laws say about the parties agreeing on procedural matters? I guess my response would depend on the, the nature of the case and the importance I thought the, the witness hearing was going to play in the overall case. If I thought the cross-examination was really going to be centrally important um, to my ability to present the case, I, I think I would be unhappy with um, being pushed to, to do a virtual hearing instead of postponing uh, to, to have a, an in-person hearing. So I think it is really a case-by-case -case assessment. I think we all have to show some flexibility in this this era, uh, in particular. Um, but uh, it, it, you know, I think there, there is something definitely lost through the virtual format. No matter. But how I think good this is. is. I agree with with David. It's hard to impose it on the tribunal if the tribunal itself doesn't feel comfortable to do it. But that shows how important it is in advance to choose arbitrators that will feel comfortable with the technology. Yeah. Um, yeah. Pick up on the question I see, which is a fast one from Professor Pichona. Would it not be better to have a second device on the side that would show screen and witnesses? Yes, I understand where you come from, but then you lose eye contact. Uh, because it's very difficult to have, I have a screen there and if I look here and I work here and then I, I want to talk here, it's, it's, being, it's quite distractive actually. But I think what works generally well is to have multiple screens and then it just becomes a question of how you lay them out so that you can avoid breaking eye contact as uh, as much as possible. So, you know, I think 
good practice is to have sort of a, a laptop with a camera right in front of you with your, your notes, another screen directly behind that um, where you may have the, the actual hearing taking place and then perhaps something on the side which would be uh, the medium by which you would communicate with your team. There's no, I mean, everybody works in different ways and everybody multitasks in different ways, so you have to find something that works for you. But I think the key message is that you, you need to figure out a way to have all the relevant information in front of you without breaking eye contact more than necessary with the camera. One arbitrator, I think it was Janet Walker, if I remember correctly, in one webinar, she showed us her personal hearing room. It was quite interesting. She had the camera here, like a separate camera, not a, a computer screen camera. And then she had one screen here and one screen here, uh, or even two screen here with her personal computer and then the sharing screen and, and then two mics. So y you can make it quite sophisticated if you want. And, and certainly it has advantages, but I think you have to figure out what works best for you and how you yourself um, use the tools. Thank you. I, I have a. I see that there is a discussion going on between Simon Nesbitt and Adam Samuel uh, regarding what you do. Uh, going back to to the question where the parties would actually refuse to have a virtual hearing and actually the arbitral tribunal being willing to do it. Maybe I can just point to Article 15, uh, Paragraph 1 of the Swiss Rules that says that the arbitral tribunal may conduct the arbitration in such manner as it considers appropriate, provided it ensures equal treatment of the parties and their right to be heard. But it is true that in principle, the arbitral tribunal will not go against parties' uh, will. Uh, one of the key features of arbitration is uh, is parties' freedom. So if both parties agree, I think that the tribunal, in most cases, will. will well, I think they're, I, I think they're bound to, and it's the agreement of the parties on procedure. I don't think the tribunal has a choice. If the, bar, if the parties agree, then I think that you know if the parties want to do agree in a virtual hearing, or they want to postpone for a live hearing, then I think the tribunal just has to go with that. Yeah, mm, we have a. Not convinced. <laughs> okay, Clarice. I think it's it's also a bit a matter of inquisitorial approach versus adversarial approach, and and the tribunal has the duty to ensure efficiency and also I mean equality of the parties and right to be heard, and and if it considers that uh, the parties made certain choices that are n you know n prejudicial for the management of the case or for the finding of of the truth or. I don't know. I wouldn't be so adamant to say that, that the tribunal is necessarily bound. Imagine you have an arbitrator who just he doesn't know how to use the, the platform um, and he just he's just at loss with the technology. Do you want to really want to force him to do it anyway? Um, well, I think so. I think Simon's question is your scenario is directed more to the situation where the parties want to postpone for a live for an in-person hearing and the tribunal is trying to force them to go ahead with a virtual one. Oh, that's when I think the tribunal has the power to do to. But both parties want to want an okay. in-person hearing. They want to postpone. Yeah, I know you're right. Then I think the, the the tribunal would have to stick to the parties' agreement. We have a related but if, question. If, or... if that's the case, David, then the other way around should also be if the parties agree on on uh, yes. <laughs> on virtual and the tribunal doesn't want to, then. But there, in the other constellation, you see that it, it's getting trickier. So I'm not sure it's a such absolute. Well. The tribunal um, needs to do a crash course and how to operate virtual hearings. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think uh, we have now reached, uh, I, at least I hope we have reached our target. I, at least I learned a certain number of things and I hope that all our 124 participants have as well. If there are further questions, I invite the participants to contact David or Clarice by email and to ask their question directly to, to them. And uh, for, for today, uh, as mentioned, we are going to, to close, but not without reminding those persons who may not have been there in the beginning. On the 16th of July, we will have the next webinar, which will be about ensuring efficient arbitral proceedings in the COVID-19 era. We will have a fireside chat without fire, but with seasoned arbitrators. Um, the, the speakers will be Matthias Scherer from LALIV, Krenguta Lewa from LDDP in Bucharest, and Richard Harding, QC from Keating Chambers in London. I hope you have all enjoyed this presentation and I hope we will see many of you on the 16th of July 
at the same time at 1 p.m. for the next presentation. Again, many thanks to David and Clarice for their presentation. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, everyone. Stay bye -bye. safe. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.